peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Oh, if I'm going to read this, I'm going to have to take my glasses off. <laughs> so now I can't see your reactions. That might be better, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me and for showing up here today, all of you. Uh, it was quite a shock to get invited to England. I really had very little idea that, you know, that anybody knew me here. And probably many of you don't know me. So I thought this first talk would be sort of an introductory talk, where I explain why I'm here, how I got here, so to speak, and then, uh, and then we'll just you know, have some question and answers. Many of the issues that I'm going to raise today during this talk, I'll talk more about in the coming days. So this is sort of like, uh, uh, you know, sending off. So uh, is that all right? <laughs> so I begin this talk by talking about how it is I became a Muslim. And then if time permits, uh, then I'll talk about the difficulties encountered after becoming a Muslim, especially with regard to fitting into the mosque culture in America. So, how did I become a Muslim? I remember when, uh, you know, I did become a Muslim, I often would go to uh, websites or read pamphlets put out by Muslims and they would claim that I converted from Christianity to Islam. And I did not convert from Christianity to Islam. I converted from atheism to Islam. I did not believe in God. Can you so I used to leave the door of my office at the University of San Francisco unlocked because I knew I would eventually lose my keys. So I left it unlocked so I could get in and out of there without having to keep going down to the main office and asking them to make a new key. So, one, so students would leave books in there, assignments, things like that. So one day I walked down to the, my office. I walked into my office. The door, of course, is open. I go in there. And I see a green text sitting on the middle of my desk. And I assumed a student left a book there. And I walk over to it, and I look at it, and on the cover of it, it says, the Holy Quran, an English interpretation. And I look at it, and I thought, who left that there? Immediately, I knew who, who must have left it, that there. It must have been my family, my adopted Muslim family. And then I thought, what are they trying to say by this? I thought they said they didn't want to talk about religion anymore. Now they're leaving a copy of the Quran on my desk? Are they trying to convert me? I mean, God, I mean, they're not even religious people, you know. My mom took me to bars and discos. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're saying if I don't become a Muslim, they're not good. our friendship can't continue. You know, all these, I'm a very sort of s skeptical person, pessimistic. I always assume the worst to begin with. But then as I thought about it more, I realized this was like a peace offering. They, I could see in their faces they were embarrassed when they said they, or indicated they didn't want to talk about religion anymore. I thought this was a way of sort of smoothing things out. Jeff, we don't want to talk about it, but if you really are interested in our religion, here's a copy of the Quran, it's our scripture. I knew it was their scripture anyway from other conversations. So I took it as a peace offering. And I didn't even bring the subject up again. I put it on my shelf, actually I put it on my coffee table in my apartment in Diamond Heights in San Francisco. I left it there. And then a couple of weeks passed, and I, uh, you know, when I was a grad student at Purdue University, I shipped all my books by the cheapest method possible to my office in San Francisco, and none of them had arrived yet. See, the only books I had with me were the ones I brought in the U-Haul in the moving van from California, uh, from Indiana, that I drove out to California with, and there was only like 20. So in no time at all, I had run out of things to read. So I had nothing to read this night. I looked at the magazines. I had already read them twice. I turned on the TV. It was Johnny Carson. So boring. I turned it off. So do you know who Johnny Carson is? <laughs> oh, all right. So now I'm sitting in my, I'm sitting in my uh, apartment and nothing to read. And I'm looking around. And I look over. And there on my table, side table, is an English interpretation of the Holy Quran. So I pick it up and think, why not? I'll read a few pages, I'll get bored, I'll put it down, 
you know, maybe lucky, hopefully it'll bore me to the extent that I'll go to sleep. No, I mean, seriously, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting much, you know. Although, you know, some script, scriptures I had read were very beautiful, I had beautiful stories. So I thought, you know, maybe the stories, the myths, etc., will be interesting. So I pick it up. I pick it up. I want to get through this part in the next 10 minutes. I pick it up. I am boring, you know, am I not? <laughs> yeah. It's like when I teach mathematics, you know, I, I'm really into it, and then I look at my students, and I'm getting all excited, and I turn to my class, and they're all like, you know, they're like, can we leave now? <laughs> I, I pick it up, and I look at the first surah, I turn to the first surah, and I'm just reading it out of academic curiosity, and, and it's, it's obviously a, a hymn of praise to me. It's like a psalm, for those of you who know the Bible. At least it starts that way. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, all praise be to God, ruler of all worlds, uh, master of the king, or master of the day of judgment. Actually, the day of requital, the day of recompense, the day when counts are settled. Uh, to you alone, and then it goes on from there. And I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, oh, a hymn of praise, a psalm. And I get to the end of it, and then as I get to the end of it, I realize, oh, the last few lines slipped into, made the subtle transition into a prayer for guidance. Show us a straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not those who have gone astray, or upon whom is violence or wrath. And I thought, what a clever author. You know, he tricked me into making a prayer for guidance, a supplication for guidance. Clever man. So, I assume the course, I assume the Quran had a human author. So I turn to the next surah, and it begins Aleph, Lam, Mim, three Arabic letters. Then that is the book. We're in no doubt is the guidance for those who are on their toes or vigilant. So I read it and I look at it and say, "So are you talking to me?" <laughs> Are you saying that this prayer for guidance that I just inadvertently made, you're now saying that this is the guidance that I was seeking? And I look at the opening line and again and it says, that is the book. And I thought, the author has a very interesting style. See, from this point in the Quran, the beginning of the second surah, from here on out, the perspective is God addressing the reader. God speaking to the reader. I always thought, you know, scripture should be like the ones I was exposed to. Stories, ancient history, story, a biography of a prophet or something. This is direct. God talking to the reader, addressing the reader. I thought, now this, the author of this book definitely was original. <laughs> he, he actually wrote a revelation from God to humanity, which is what you would think a revelation would be. But not only that, he has a very engaging style. He, he gets you to ask questions, and then, get, then gives answers, and then creates more questions. Somehow, this Quran, he wrote in a style that gets you into a dialogue with the, the scripture. Like that just brief dialogue I just mentioned. I'd have that experience repeatedly as I read through the Quran. This dialogue, I'd find myself drawn in. I'd ask a question. A few lines later, sometimes a couple passages later, maybe I would see an answer. And then I would create another question. And then I was involved in this veritable dialogue with the scripture. So, <laughs> okay, I have to stop in four minutes and give the taper a break. So, uh, so I keep on reading the Quran. I think that I'm impressed by the author's original and ingenious style. And then the next several verses, uh, the next several passages uh, summarize the Quran's major themes, talks about who get, could be guided by the scripture, who can't, sort of the prerequisites for getting guided. I thought that's very clever, so, sort of same way we write math text. And then I come, of course, to the famous allegory, which you would expect after you get through an introduction. The Quran is going to talk about homo sapiens, human beings, and their origin and what their life is all about, in the famous allegory of the first man and first woman. So that begins in the 30th verse of the second surah. Should I stop here? And, 
Okay. We just have to give him one minute to switch. So, I've come to the 30th verse of the Quran. Now, up till now, I am impressed with the author's style, but I'm only 30, what, 36 verses into the Quran? I'm not so impressed and I'm captivated by the scripture. But I come to the 30th verse and it begins, Behold, your Lord said to the angels. Behold, your Lord said to the angels. So we're about to hear a heavenly announcement, a heavenly election, a great moment. So, this great election. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to put a vicegerent of mine on earth, a viceroy, an emissary, a representative of mine. This is a noble election. God is about to create man and assign him a noble role. I immediately said to myself, no, he, he obviously got the story all wrong. Man is not put on earth to fill some noble role. He's put on earth as a punishment. Because that's, in my religious tradition, the one of my birth, the one I abandoned, and I'm not putting it down, but that's the way the story is told. And I felt the author got confused when he was, you know, repeating the story. I mean, this was my perspective. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am about to put a vicegerent of mine on earth. And then the angels said, and the angels said, will you put therein one who will spread corruption? and shed much blood, while we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you, glorify your holy name. And I read that verse, and I just stared at it. I couldn't, I was captivated. I was angry. I could feel the heat rising inside me. Because look what it says. Will you put there in one God says, I'm going to put, assign these humans this noble role. And then, God, and then the angels say, are you going to create this being who spreads corruption and sheds much blood? This most criminal, violent, destructive creature? And put him on earth in this role? When you could create us, as they plainly say, while we celebrate your praises and glorify you? How could you create this and assign him that role when we are clearly more, more deserving and more appropriate? Are you following me? And that was my question. That was my life. That was my childhood. All of it just encapsulated in those 15 words. And I was shocked. I thought the author is committing theological suicide. You don't ask the most poignant question in the history of man's theological reflections. A question for which there is no rational answer. In the beginning of the story of the first man and woman. At least wait to the end of the scripture. <laughs> but don't put it from the start. I had to find out how he answered the question, as, as disturbing as I thought the question was, how it brought back all my childhood, I had to find out. And so I was hooked. I wanted to see how the author answered that question. So I began reading through the Quran, and I immediately got some hints, but it didn't fill in the picture. So I kept reading and reading and reading. And to tell you the truth, and this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, at tomorrow's lecture, for the youth, for the people who consider themselves youth. By the time I had finished the Quran, all the arguments I had against the existence of God 